As we discussed in a previous lecture, the Enlightenment was a vast 18th century cultural movement which led to the questioning of tradition in general and a confident emphasis on human reason. It also gave rise to critical Bible scholarship as we saw in our unit on Judaism. Inspired by this, in the 19th century there was a broad movement for a liberal, that is a free, kind of Christianity. One which was free of superstitious tradition and one which was compatible with science and with scientific study of the Bible. For example, many of them would say that the story in the first chapters of Genesis is true, but it's not to be interpreted literally. It would be false if interpreted literally. It's evolutionary theory that gives us the literal true story of the origin of the species. Another thing that concerned them was miracles. For interesting reasons we can't go into here, many Enlightenment thinkers were suspicious of miracles and of reports of miracles. In liberal Christianity, then, they tended to either deny miracles as baseless myths, in other words, those things simply didn't happen, we all know we're modern people, aren't we, that miracles don't occur, or they sometimes reinterpreted them naturalistically. For instance, during the Exodus, Moses parts the Red Sea by the miraculous power of God, it would seem. To reinterpret that naturalistically, you would say, Maybe a big wind just happened to blow up at the right moment, and the sea was somehow parted where they could cross it. Or people have speculated about another event later in Genesis, that's God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He rains down fire and brimstone on these two evil cities. Maybe a volcano went off. The strategy then is to think that something as reported happened, but that that something was in accordance with natural law. I give you two of the more plausible examples a lot of the miracles just don't seem to admit of this treatment. Jesus instantaneously turning water into wine early in the Gospel of John, for instance. It's not clear how you would interpret that naturalistically. Or Jesus raising from the dead on the third day after his death. Another theme was that many of the biblical narratives, many of the stories in the Bible, are not reliable. And there was a tendency to see ethics or right behavior as the whole point of religion. Again, in step with the times, some of them thought that the whole point of religion was not exactly ethics, but rather feelings or experiences. We saw this view before when we discussed the views of Friedrich Schleiermacher and Rudolf Otto. Either way, whether the focus is on ethics or on a certain kind of mystical religious experience, the focus has taken off belief, that is, traditional belief. That was the point. All of this rational reinterpretation of the Christian tradition tended to de-emphasize the Jewishness of Jesus and of early Christianity. Absurdly, some of them even argued that Jesus was not really a Jew. How could he have been? He was such a good guy. There was an anti-Semitic flavor to some of this. And in fact, in Germany, some of them ended up supporting Hitler's National Socialist Party. Be that as it may, liberal Christianity is still around. In America, many older denominations have liberal wings. There was a time in the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century where this was really the religious mainstream in America. But those denominations have been losing ground to more conservative or traditional interpretations of Christianity in the last 50 years or so. There was a big and extended pushback against this kind of reinterpretation of the Christian tradition. In Protestantism, there was the fundamentalist movement. Now you have to be careful about the word fundamentalist. It's basically a pejorative term. The Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga has defined the term fundamentalist semi-seriously as stupid son of a bitch with religious views far to the right of mine. So it kind of means idiot religious right winger. Well, if that's what it means, it's not a very helpful term when it comes to scholarship. It's a term of abuse. It's a club to be used in culture wars. But originally this term was coined by this group of conservative Protestants who wanted to insist on five main points in pushing back against liberal Christianity. These were the verbal inspiration of the Bible, which implies that there is no error of any kind in the original manuscripts, belief in the virginal conception of Jesus, belief in the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. This is an interpretation of the death of Jesus where Jesus, in some sense, takes the place of sinners and takes their punishment for them on the cross. Fourth, belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. This was against liberal tendencies to say that Jesus was raised from the dead, but what that means is we just really remember him and value him nowadays. Against that, they said, no, Christianity has always taught that Jesus' body came back to life, was transformed into an immortal body, and lives even today. And fifth, belief in a literal second coming of Jesus, that he'll come back bodily, just as he left. 
Here's an interesting anti-modernist or anti-liberal cartoon from the year 1922, The Descent of the Modernists. I'm not sure if these guys are supposed to be professors or ministers or both, but they start off in the bright sunshine of Christianity, and the first bad step they take is that the Bible is not infallible. Next thing you know, they're denying all these other things as they descend down into this dark basement. I guess that maybe they're going down to hell. Those five points were the things reasserted by the fundamentalist movement in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, especially after the famous Scopes trial in 1925, which concerned the teaching of evolution in public schools. The fundamentalist movement came to really insist on a literal interpretation of the first couple chapters of Genesis, and they insisted that this required denying evolution. This is a familiar position nowadays, but this was hardly the universal Christian reaction to the Darwinian theory of evolution. Many learned Christians simply replied, well, I guess that's how God created the species then. This issue is still very much a live matter of debate among conservative Protestant Christians, at least in America. The fundamentalist movement went into decline after World War I. It tended to be kind of reactionary and to reject things like going to movies, smoking, having fun down at the bowling alley, drinking. It tended to reject a lot of things in mainstream culture that arguably Christianity did not need to reject. The current American evangelical brand of Christianity evolved out of the fundamentalist movement starting in the 1950s. It was a kinder, less strident, less reactionary, and more informed kind of conservative Christianity. They tried to not deny all critical biblical scholarship. They tried to be consistent with science as they could be. And they tended to fit in with the broader culture to a much greater extent than the fundamentalists did. They were still committed then to those five points of the fundamentalist movement, but they didn't call themselves fundamentalists, and they didn't adopt a lot of the cultural stances that fundamentalists did. It was a kind of Christianity better suited to play an important role in the mainstream of American culture. And they have been very mainstream in the last 50 years or so. In the 1970s, something important to American culture happened, the evangelical movement was politically mobilized through groups particularly like Jerry Falwell's The Moral Majority. Evangelical Christians became a voting bloc, and by the time of Ronald Reagan, that voting bloc was firmly committed to the Republican Party. This is called the Christian right, as in right wing, as in politically conservative. And this voting bloc still exists to a large extent, although there are cracks in it. Roman Catholics, too, in their own way, fought against what they called modernism, in recent years, there have been two very influential and very conservative, very traditionally Roman Catholic popes, John Paul II and Benedict XVI. They too have defended traditional Christian theology. Not so much verbal inspiration of the Bible or inerrancy, those are Protestant concern and emphasis, or substitutionary atonement, but definitely the virgin birth of Jesus, bodily resurrection of Jesus, and the second coming of Jesus. In our next and final segment in this lecture, Paul, Peter, and the Gentiles.